Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm your host, Eric Quanstrom, the CMO at Science. Today's episode is was really a fun one for me. Um, I got a ton out of this. I felt that the conversation was super meaningful and deep. And the reason why is our guest, Andrew Sykes, brings it. Um, <laughs> so Andrew is the CEO and founder at Habits at Work. And they are a sales consultancy that is really all about building successful habits for sales professionals. And so that's kind of like their mission, especially as it relates to trust. And you'll hear loud and clear, and this comes across <laughs> in full color with Andrew, because he's a very trustworthy guy, knows the research cold, understands kind of like how to, how to role play. And, and we deconstruct a cold call and how to build trust during it. And you're going to get a very, very informative, insightful, um, chock full of research and wisdom type of discussion about it, our world, the sales development world, and how we can be honorable interrupters, which I think is a, a highlight point. Further credibility, Andrew is, uh, in addition to CEO and founder Habits at Work, which you guys should definitely check out, um, he's a TEDx speaker. He's a lecturer at the Kellogg uh, School of Management. He is a Vistage speaker. And so this is someone for whom the opinions that are shared on, the, on this interview are very well founded and grounded, um, again, in the research and insights around human behavior uh, that are well worth listening to. So I thoroughly enjoyed this discussion, and I think you guys will too. Without further ado, here's Andrew Sykes. And we're back with Andrew Sykes. Andrew is the Chief Executive Officer of Habits at Work. And Andrew, you, you, you kind of have um, a very illustrious career talking about the workplace, talking about trust, talking about some of the big themes, if you will, um, that we all deal with every single day. Yes, I do. And I've, I've had the joy of having a couple of decades as a salesperson as a sales leader and as a sales coach and teacher in the work I do at the Kellogg Sales Institute. So you might say I'm, I'm in love with the sales profession and I haven't yet reached the point where I've stopped learning about how we can improve and my own personal mission, how we can become the most trustworthy profession on the planet. Well, we're starting from a place where uh, sales is actually not really that trustworthy. I mean, you look at most studies and we're somewhere below I don't know, politicians, lobbyists. You're right. Every study I've seen has the bottom place occupied by salespeople, often joined by marketing executives. But believe it or not, as you said, below politicians, which always blows my mind. So I'm clear I've got my work cut out for me. But I also believe that selling is helping other people make progress in their lives. And that's a kind of noble profession. And so done well, I believe we deserve to be trusted. But some of the behaviors we've practiced in the past have caused this reputation for all of us, whether it was our own actions that caused it or the people that came before us, we're all burdened with that reputation. Yeah. And I think that most of the listeners of this podcast, I think, share your opinion that sales is a noble profession, obviously, because, you know, they're, they're in it. They're either SDRs or SDR uh, management and leadership. Uh, or company executives that that really value kind of the sales development motion. So talk to me a little bit about um, your view, if you will, let's go high to low. When, when you think about the SDR role, technically we are kind of like interrupting any prospect's day whenever we're reaching out, regardless of channel, always. True? True. And so if if we... <clears throat> Our professional interrupters seems antithetical to building trust. Why isn't it? Well, it, it is antithetical to building trust because you are disturbing someone's progress. They were either having dinner or heading to lunch or in a meeting or doing something that didn't include you. And now, as you say, we are perhaps rudely, from their point of view, interrupting their day. And that is a trust destroyer in a moment. I often ask people to imagine, you know, walking down the main road in your, your town and you're minding your own business, 
passing people in the street who you sort of trust at a five out of 10. And then you see three people ahead of you all wearing the same t-shirts with clipboards. And in a moment you have that sinking feeling because you know they're about to interrupt you. And you're asking them, you're asking two questions. Who are you and what do you want? And before they even open their mouths, you've answered, I bet you want my money, my time, my signature, or otherwise to impede my progress. And that doesn't feel like someone you want to speak to. Yep. So I think for SDRs, the mindset begins with recognizing we are an interruption. Yeah. Given that, we're in danger of a lot of traps or pitfalls, holes, if you like, that we'll be put into by our prospects unless we're very deliberate with how we design and deliver on our first impression. Yeah, and, and I think just taking that knowledge forward, once you kind of accept that fact, um, you can work with it. It doesn't have to be a, a, a bug. It can be a feature, actually. Yeah, it can be your secret weapon if you have thought carefully about and done something that very few salespeople do, which is take the time to design the first three minutes of your interaction with someone. And I don't mean, you know, practice the script that you've been given. I'm talking about even upstream from that before you even open your mouth to the small talk that gets you the next couple of minutes to your introduction that buys you the right to have a conversation or if indeed you have a script to use your script. Yeah, I love that. Designing the interaction is a very close uh, proxy for a, a similar phrase that we use here at, in science where we call it conversation architecture. And so we think a lot about, you know, what should a conversation include? What is the likely state of mind of, of any prospect that we might be reaching out to? And therefore, how do we start these interactions that, that we might have every day, but the person on the other end of the line um, may not be having as frequently? Yes. And I think the urgency and importance of, of conversation architecture or first impression design really comes from understanding the research in trust. Because perhaps the most common thing I hear from salespeople is that trust takes time to build. And I understand why it feels that way, because from our lived experience, it often does take months to get a meeting, and that meeting might require some follow-up to get a second meeting. And there's just this push and this grind until that point when the relationship seems to turn and the prospect becomes an interested potential customer. That is sometimes you know, weeks, often months. And so the old maxim, trust takes time to build sounds right but it's wrong but right of, yeah it sounds right but none of the research in trust supports that view all the research suggests that people make assessments of you as trustworthy or not in minutes not months in some cases in microseconds not months so you may save yourself months of what you think is building trust but is actually digging yourself out of a trust hole by designing this first impression. And there's more to say about this trust hole because it's an important distinction, the difference between building trust and climbing out of a trust hole. Well, let, let's unpack that. Let's even say, according to the research, how are we defining building trust? Yeah. Well, I define trust as a person vulnerably exposing themselves to the actions or promises and delivery on those promises of another human being. So for someone to trust us when they've just picked up the phone and we're a complete stranger is an extraordinarily vulnerable thing to do. Sure. And people are disinclined to do that if they suspect we've got a motive. And that motive is their self-interest. Yep. So sell me something I don't need at a price I can't afford <laughs> that I was ready. You know, the three yep. things I have happened or any of them have happened and so for most people i think we immediately confirm the suspicions of prospects by yeah. saying something like hi oh, my name is andrew i'm a sdr or sales development rep from habits at work and what i've just done is labeled myself as part of the group of people who we know are the least trustworthy on the planet yeah could you could you do anything worse and as a result, we put into this thing I call a trust hole, which is, you know, back to that example of meeting someone on the street. 
scale of one to 10, 10 is, I trust you to always do what you say you're going to do. And one is, I can't trust you as far as I can throw you. Mm. Most humans say, we trust other unknown humans at a five. But I would say when we meet salespeople and they confirm that they are salespeople and we suspect that they have bad intentions because of their money motivation, we don't take them down to a one out of five. We take them to a negative. Yeah, I think that's we, true. Yeah, we, be, we start trusting them to be untrustworthy, to deceive us, as I said, sell us something we don't need or don't want at a price we can't afford too soon. And that has really profound implications because when someone judges you as untrustworthy, they don't notice that they have a confirmation bias, yeah. which is everything you do or say, they're going to filter through the lens of, Ah, there you go again, Andrew, being that untrustworthy salesperson. So it takes an awfully long time for you to, to establish a track record of behavior that has them think, maybe, maybe I was wrong about my first assessment. Let me give this person another chance. And frankly, more often than not, we never granted the opportunity to prove our trustworthiness. We don't give it a second chance. So the stakes are really high for SDRs to make sure those first seconds and minutes count. Well, and it's very circuitous too. I mean, technically you're talking about a lot more work and a lot more execution to get to back to that rebuilt as opposed to perhaps starting <laughs> starting off on a different foot. Yeah, or, or dare I say in your first three minutes, establishing yourself as someone that a prospect would like to spend time with. Yeah. I'm always fascinated by this research that says, Customers are doing more and more pre-work themselves online and they're spending 10 to 15 minutes with salespeople and they don't love the experience. So what can we do to make those 10 or 15 minutes really count? And my question is, what can we do as humans so that prospects actually want to spend time with us like they do with their friends and trusted colleagues? Isn't that the better problem to solve? It's a way better problem to solve. So let's, let's get to the business of solving it. What do you think especially according to the research, are techniques, motivations, tone, things that we could be doing to start off on the right foot as opposed to the wrong foot? Yeah, I think there are three or four and I'll, I'll tackle them in order. The first one is before you even open your mouth, what can you do? And whether it's over Zoom or any other virtual platform or live, all the research says three things matter most. Number one is making eye contact, which over Zoom, I'm on a Mac, that means looking at the little green dot rather than the video screen, which takes some discipline. And I have to say that that depends on the culture. There are cultures in which direct eye contact can seem offensive. But in the American context, and certainly in most westernized countries, eye contact is a signal that I'm sincere and I'm telling the truth because the alternative you know, looking away and looking down is a signal of hiding something. Yeah. The second one is equally obvious is leading with a big smile and having the discipline as an SDR to smile if you're on camera and always have your camera on, but to smile if you're on the telephone too. Yeah. Because yeah, someone's voice when they're speaking through a smile versus not. By the way, isn't it crazy? Like, I think most people listening to this would agree with the statement, you can hear a smile. Right. I mean, I mean it's it like, logically, that makes no sense. And it's a, it's a great exercise to do. Simply talk to someone and have them talk to you sort of with an angry face and then yeah. talk to you with a smile and you'll hear the difference. It's so plain. And the, why I love the, the smile part of this is because of the neuroscience behind it. You know, we, we discovered some decades ago these mirror neurons that fire in our brain in response to seeing someone else's action, in this case, a smile, priming us to do the same thing, which is why we say smiles and yawns are catchy. But the beautiful little nuance to that is if we smile at a prospect and they smile back at us, even if it's telephonic, there's a little perhaps unspoken voice in their head which says, I'm smiling, therefore I probably like and trust Eric. Yeah. And so you get those two advantages. There were three things, of course, which is body language. If you're in 
person, you know, folded arms versus an open posture, palms forward versus hands behind your back or in your pockets, or just generally your way of being, which is showing up with some excitement. Like I'm happy to be an an interruption because boy, do I have something that can change your life. You may not right. express that, but as a conversation with yourself, I think that prepares you to have your first milliseconds count. And a lot of people will say, well, Andrew, you know, humans are more gracious than that. They'll wait for me to blow it in conversation versus judge me before I've opened my mouth. But if you look at the research on interviews, it's surprising how many interviewers said, I had decided whether to hire the person or not, watching them walk into my office. Yeah. So I think those assessments are made very, very quickly. So that's Snap the judgments. First one. Snap judgments. And the truth is most of us feel like and in fact, are pretty good judges of character, even on such a thin slice. Now, there's a little bit of bias in there because we often experience people as living into our expectations because of the way we filter how they behave. But I think most people, and I've asked classrooms full of students this question, would say, are you a good judge of character? Yes. Can you do it in microseconds? Pretty much. Yeah. So that's what our prospects are doing to us. And, and then comes the inevitable piece where you either jump straight in, having not earned the right to say, well, I hope I'm not interrupting you, but can I tell you about uh, science, please? And that's kind of rude. Yeah. So I think there is a set of complementary moves there that can build trust. The one I'll label as permission asking, mm -hmm. the other one I will label as creative connection questions. So the first one is fairly obvious. It's asking permission for the conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's not just simply saying, Eric, might we have a conversation about science and what we do in this company? I think you'll enjoy it. It's including a why behind it. Yeah. Because I remember reading some great research. I can't cite it, so don't ask me, but I'll uh, remember reading about an experiment where people were asked to interrupt a long line of people at an airport and try and get to the front of the line because they were going to miss their airplane. Yes. And the people who said, you know, I'm late, can I jump the line, were turned down flat, as you might expect, by angry passengers. Other people who provided a reason, even if it was something like, I overslept, so I'm going to miss my plane, may I skip the line? 80% of the time, other humans say yes to a request if you've given them the reason, and here's the key, this reason is the first piece of evidence that you're there for a purpose other than your self-interested motive. Yeah. So you might say, I know I'm an interruption today, and I'm committed to adding value to your life in the few minutes we might spend together if you're gracious enough to give you our time. May I take two minutes to simply introduce myself and tell you why I'd like to speak to you? Yeah. Yeah, the other, the other thing that's brilliant about that, um, two points, the first of which is you're labeling a situation at that point. And the label is actually a very powerful thing because from hostage negotiation to you know entry, entry into a cold call, um, there's a great body of work that, that indicates that labels are super powerful amongst humans and produce the right kinds of outcomes. Um, second thing that I would say is, I think the study, uh, or at least one of the studies that's very similar is done by Robert Cialdini um, in his book, Persuasion. And he he talks a, a lot about and uses the, the forcing function word of because, like, can I cut in line because, and then all somebody hears when they hear the word because is what's after yeah. that word. And so that reason becomes, again, to your point, something beyond yourself, even if it is self-serving. <laughs> Even if it is, yeah. But uh, given that we're an interruption, labeled as such, right? you think we should seek a reason that is aligned with our noble cause as salespeople? Totally. But, but the thing that's interesting to click into is if you're a prospect hearing this, one of the, the powerful paradigms that gets shifted is you move from professional interrupter that probably falls into a very stereotypical, stereotypical bucket of... Oh, they're just going to pitch me. It's going to be all about them. And when you break that pattern, break that frame, all of a sudden now the, the, the brain is like, oh, 
okay, why did they call? Yes, and they've gone back to asking those questions. Who are you and what do you want? Exactly. And they've been thinking before you said that uh, you're a cold caller, telemarketer, and you're trying to annoy me and something, something. Yeah. So at least opens them up by sort of almost jarring them by the unusual nature of that opening so that they're left wondering, well, what is this about? Well, because here's the other thing that I think is true of, of the vast majority of humans, especially in today's modern era, and, and let's stick on the phone for obvious like um, ease of discussion. The person did decide to pick up, right? They could have let it go to voicemail. They could have just not done so. Because they picked up, I think that there's a, a thread. It may not be a strong thread, but a thread of curiosity. Who is this and what do they want? Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, back to that question of being an interruption. I happen to think that being an interruption is an honorable thing to be in someone's life. If as a result of you standing in their pathway, they have to go around you in a different direction than they would have otherwise gone but it happens to serve them. It's like a shortcut to success in their life. Then what a wonderful thing to be an interruption. I pride myself on the greatest interruptions I've been in other people's lives. And I'm super grateful for the interruptions they've been in my life. I like that. I'm going to steal that honorable interrupter. I love that as a, like sure. a phrase or a label. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's jump back in because I said that there were two things that I recommend you do in the domain of small talk. Yes. The other is, you know, in addition to asking permission, which might come first or might come second of these two partners, it is being more creative and more interesting than asking the most polite but most boring connection question on the planet, how are you today? Yeah. We all do it. No one listens to it. In fact, we all hope that we never meet someone who actually answers the question, how are you? Because we don't want to know about their mom's surgery and their this and that in their lives. <laughs> yeah, and as right. a result, we've just automatically done it. And it's a very, very hard habit to break. So two things I'll say about that. One is try out if you're an SDR, asking a more interesting and on purpose, a personal question. And the reaction I get is, Andrew, you probably haven't earned the right yet. And I acknowledge that to ask something like, you know, Eric, I know we've just met, I've just interrupted you, but may I ask, what's the best book you've ever read and why? And I think many prospects would say, look, who the hell is this? I'm not answering that question. It's too soon. But coming back to your point about the because, if I lead with a little story that is an answer to that question for myself, then suddenly there's a reason why I'm asking that. Yeah. So I may say, Eric, I know I've just interrupted you. And yesterday I got a call from a salesperson, implying that I'm not one, who interrupted me and it was really annoying. The worst call I got yesterday. May I ask you, what's the worst experience you've ever had on the phone? So it could be a question that's preceded by a little story. Now, Love that. I know that as SDRs, we don't have a lot of time, partly because we don't create the time by earning trust. Yeah. But it, it is the more challenging of the first two things to ask that more interesting connection question. But even if you can't, there is at least an opportunity to answer the standard old question, how are you more interestingly? Because one thing you can almost surely count on is if I'm interrupting you, I acknowledge that, I ask permission, and then I say, may I just begin by asking you, how's your day? You're very likely to answer, fine, thank you, and be a little curt because you want to get on with it. Yeah. Might and very likely say, and how are you? And that's my opening to be more creative than saying, fine, thank you. Here's what I want to talk to you about today. And to use it as an intrigue question. Yeah. Or the answer, like, actually, I'm having a great day because I've spoken to four amazing people and the conversation I want to have with you really struck a chord with them because of the gem I had to share with them. So thank you for asking. <laughs> I love that. Because you know what question is coming next, right? Which is what's the gem, Andrew? Yeah, it's a great give and take. And you're priming the, the other person you're talking to to want more information, almost demand it from you. Like you just said, what is the gem? And just think about the difference between how you feel, maybe going back to when you were a kid, 
how you felt when someone told you what to do versus when you ask someone how to do something. So when you're asking, it's a completely different complexion to the conversation. So a, an answer to the question, how are you, that invites a question and invites me to say more, feels different to the person to whom I'm then answering. Yeah, I think, um, you know, kind of coming back up to maybe a 20,000 foot level, especially dissecting a cold call. One of the things that I think is really smart about what you're advising consistent with the research is everything's really geared towards leading with them. I think it was, it might've been Dale Carnegie um, who said, interested is interesting. And I, if I'm not mistaken, that was said over a hundred years ago. <laughs> and yet it's- Interesting, yes. Right. And it's probably more true today than it is even back then, or humans like haven't changed that much. Um, would you agree with that? And, and furthermore, should that be part of our kind of motivation as SDRs, as conversation starters with every call that we take or make? Yes, I think that quote holds true today like it did then. In fact, I said it backwards earlier with intention. The way he said it, if, if memory serves, was to be interesting, be interested, which right. was a push for a curious mindset and asking questions. But I also think there's something to be said from saying it slightly differently, which is to have someone be interested in you, be interesting. And being interesting, one way of doing that is, of course, making it all about them. But another way is showing up with a big smile and, a, and eye contact and energy and asking a more interesting connection question because it sure. peaks with curiosity. Like, if nothing else, for the novelty of the experience versus every other cold call we've ever gotten. Totally. Again, breaking that frame, breaking that pattern. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I, I, I think is probably really relevant to, to talk through is how can we make it, um, and, and you just said this, when we were kids, we learned when somebody was telling us what to do, we actually resist. The human brain like resists being told anything, doesn't it? Of course it does, absolutely. Which is why I think the adage show rather than tell makes so much shit sense. I know you had uh, a wonderful Philip Hum on your podcast previously. Yeah. He wrote a book called Story Selling. He, like I consider myself to be a storyteller, have come to notice that if you can show people what to do in a story, or even more subtly, allow them to see, then they'll take away the lesson, the thing that you wanted to tell them what to do, but they'll feel like it was their own. They'll just remember it, their brilliance happened in your presence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, reminds me of another famous quote. Um, I want to say it was uh, a, a female writer. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name, but people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. My Angelou. My oh, Angelou, my. thank you. Love her, her poetry. I, I didn't tell you, and it's not the part of our podcast, but I'm an aspiring performance poet, so I'm very much uh, inspired by Maya Angelou. Yeah, and truer words. Um, back to the, the told you versus the asking. Isn't it a really interesting place in a conversation then when we can gather information about a person, their circumstance, their maybe status quo, what they've got going on in their business, especially as it relates to, say, our business and what we're calling about, and then having the ability for us, and I found this to be a, a very effective technique for really success on the, cold, on, the, on the calling channel at leading to appointments, is if we can also reintroduce that word because, and we can say something along the lines of, well, because you told me X, Y, and Z, I'm going to recommend we meet to go down this path and talk about it further and figure out fit and ultimately have a deeper conversation, which is at the essence, the beginning of a sales cycle, right? It is indeed, yes. And I think there's a lot to unpack in what you said because I, I believe that the purpose of an SDR's first call is to firstly earn the right to complete the call. Yes. And secondly, to gain the next meeting for themselves or someone else. And that distinction really matters because setting up a call for me, number two, you know, the second call is very, very different from a trust transfer point of view than me setting up 
in the worst case, a demo with my account executive. I have a soapbox issue. I hate the idea that SDRs set up a demo rather than invite the prospect to a deeper discovery conversation. It just right. sets things up for failure. But there's a lot, I think, in that area of like reminding yourself that my second job is to get a meeting. My yep. first job is to earn the right for this conversation. Because being an interrupter, I have not earned that right. In fact, I've done the opposite. Well, and I think that what we've talked about here is the evidence of conversations done well, where we're doing exactly that. We're, we're focusing in on kind of like the four elements that help build trust. You know, we're, we're really providing value. We're making it all about the person we're talking to, to earn that right. Aren't we? We are. And I have to say, and taking time to make it clear to them who we are and why we're there. Yeah. Because if we make it all about them straight away, that feels like an ambush. Totally. So I was talking to a customer of mine yesterday and one of his colleagues had just been through some sales training where she volunteered her personal origin story, which we'll talk about in a moment, I hope, and her connection question. And he gave her a hell about it saying, it's all about the customer. All you need to do is talk to them. I disagree. If you, I've just picked up the phone and you saying, Andrew, may I ask you a question? Like, what's keeping you up at night? Or I'm calling about your, your uh, meetings setting up or your funnel filling. Is this a good time? Like, who are you and what do you want? So you right. have to have addressed that before I give you the time and the space to make yeah. it all about me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is where there's a, a, an art to any of that, isn't it? This is, I mean, we're really talking about the essence of an SDR role, like deconstructed and laid bare and the strategies of what oftentimes means success versus failure. Yeah, I think an SDR role is one of the hardest in the sales game because the job to be done is something that few humans can do at all and mm -hmm. even can do well, which is to build trust that lasts through time in minutes. Yeah. And to do that over and over again, it's a mindset game, it's a discipline game, but mostly it's a design game as we've been discussing. And that, you know, comes to what I think are the next two moves, which are interesting, which is the way you make promises and the way you introduce yourself. And again, many SDRs say, you know, I never even get that chance to introduce myself on a call. I've, I've been told to jump straight into the script or make it all about them. So I just say, you know, my name is Andrew. I'm the head of sales at Habits at Work, and I'd love to talk to you about X. And that kind of introduction, as we said earlier, just makes it clear I'm the untrustworthy interrupting salesperson. Yeah. So I recommend to SDRs and all salespeople, in fact, all leaders, because I happen to think to lead is to sell and vice versa, to introduce yourself using the briefest of origin stories that reveals who you are why you're there in the biggest sense of your role mm -hmm. and that you're someone who is credible, who has a track record and who's humble. So instead of a one-liner, my name's Andrew, head of sales, or worse, a resume may dump, if invited to introduce yourself, my name's Andrew and I work chair and then I work there and then I did this and then I got that degree and everyone's asleep. In three sentences, you can say, here's my credible background. Here's the insight or moment that led me to do what I do today, which is my why, not money. And here's the privilege of what I get to do today, subtext, and what I've done for many others before. Yep. That might sound like, thank you for asking me. I'm going to begin by introducing myself, if you don't mind, briefly. My name is, pause, Andrew, so you can hear and remember it. I've had the pleasure of being in leadership, teaching, and sales roles for three decades. But five years ago, I realized that without trust, nothing is possible in leadership or in sales. And so today I lead a team and a university class that teaches people how to be the most trustworthy person in the room. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> you know, Boom. A, background, a moment and the privilege of the impact you have today. Yeah. So that's the formula I use for 
crafting short, pithy, but meaningful introductions. And Eric, if we've got time, I'd like to add one last little method, which is of course what I think is making a responsible promise for what will come on the call. I mm -hmm. think we label this under conversation architecture. Because with, without telling someone who's just picked up the phone, who you've interrupted, what's going to happen, how long the call is going to last, and what you're going to do on it, they're required to answer those questions that are in their mind with probably the worst version of the answer, one that doesn't yeah. serve. Like, oh, this is going to take a long time. They're going to ambush me with a bunch of questions. And all they're doing is trying to look for that moment of weakness that gets me into a meeting with them next week. So I've got to start guarding myself already. Yeah. So I can take away all that fear by making what I call a responsible promise, which is telling you what I will do and following that with the beautiful question of what else do you trust me to do? Or what else do you expect me to do? That signals I intend to earn the right for your trust. So it might sound like, Eric, I know interruptions in our lives are not welcome. And so I'd like to begin by making a promise for how this call will go if you give me the five minutes I think we'll need. What I'd like to first do is give you the briefest introduction to who I am and why I'm here. And then what I'd like to do is ask you just two or three questions about X. And you can count on me to listen play back what I hear. And if at any point during the call, you feel like the conversation isn't serving you, please feel free to say, not now or no, thank you, Andrew. And I'll end the call by, if you're interested, an invitation for another conversation some down, somewhere down the line. And of course, you're under no obligation to provide that. You won't find any pressure tactics from me. That is my promise to you. And I'm promising you that because I'm committed to every interruption I make, leaving you happy that I made the introduction, the interruption, not annoyed. May I ask, is that promise acceptable to you? And if you get a yes, proceed. And if you get a no, either way, the question to ask is, if you get a no, I'm sorry, what, what, what did I miss and what else could I add? And if you get a yes to say, thank you for that. Before we jump right in, may I ask, is there anything else that you trust me to do on this call? Or trust me not to do? And I you may that. have an answer, but asking the question is an expert move. What a great technique because you're introducing and you're unpacking the, the trust. And what I'm really hearing, or it's coming across to me, is you're basically creating an upfront contract with tons of outs. And by the way, I think that the research suggests that the more outs you give people, the less they take. Yeah. Or give them an out, as, as Chris Foss said, I think, you know, give them something to say no to early on if you want to. Yeah. I've found that being humble and asking permission gets you a long, long way without the trick of having to get people to say no to something. Now, I do want to say something about trick and tactic, because a lot of people hear me teach this stuff and say, Andrew, those are a bunch of great tactics to manipulate people into a meeting. It all comes from the upstream mindset. My job is to be an interruption that helps people make progress in their lives. And I'll be committed and bold in that, but humble in the face of someone's rejection and yep. grateful for the fact that they gave me seconds if that's all I get. I love that servant mindset because you really can't go wrong once you kind of adopt it, can you? Well... I'd like to say you can't go wrong. I have, well, I mean, uh, we're in a failure-based business. Yeah. I, I often I liken it to... Because we all do, and we're tempted by things, and we're filled with too much knowledge, so we often want to tell about our product before we sure. have done discovery. But yes, I think that mindset either hides or prevents many sins. Yeah. Maybe pre-forgives is the right word. That's actually a great way of putting it. I would agree wholeheartedly with that because here's the thing, like you're never going, I, I've yet to meet the SDR that has a hundred percent like positive dispositions after every call that they do. You know what I mean? Like that's just not realistic. Um, but where the money, you know, really is made won and lost where the success, where the even job satisfaction I think comes from is moving the respective percentages of something you do all day, every day forward 
like, like any sport, increasing your win rate. Exactly. By practicing the drills that make you a fantastic soccer player mm -hmm. or chess player or ballet dancer or SDR. I mean, I, I like the, this is a game mindset for SDRs because it can be a slog and an exhausting one with the mindset, I have to make these calls and I'm expecting a one in a thousand answer rate and a one in a hundred conversion rate. I mean, that sounds like torture unless you see it as a game. And frankly, unless you get good at it, so your numbers go up. Right. Yeah. I mean, I actually love the sports analogies and I oftentimes liken STR work to baseball, which is when you truly understand the game, a game based on failure, you know, getting out <laughs> seven yeah. out of every 10 times as opposed to eight makes you the difference between an all-star and a, <laughs> you know, someone I who had gets not thought of it that way. That's a, that's thank you for educating me. Demoted to the minor leagues. <laughs> um, and, and a, there's a natural corollaries too, where, you know, in baseball, you get a certain number of at bats. There's only, a, you know, depending on the length of the game, how many at bats you'll have that day. And so each one of those can become the research, the um, model from which to build on in the next at bat, right? Like how I want to handle that, that with this pitcher. <laughs> and yeah. so having those wins and getting that win rate up to me is, the you know really the definition of like oh that's a fastball that's a slider that's a curveball that i'm seeing and not hitting well okay now i can learn and improve along those lines yeah absolutely love that thank you for sharing <laughs> that knowledge <laughs> yeah my, my... the other thing that that worries me about sdrs is increasingly as sales leaders have separated the sdr role from an account executive is how you end a call by being the most trustworthy person for your account executive, but by also being conscious of the fact that if you've earned enough trust to complete the call and even done such a great job to get your prospect to agree to come to the next meeting, not with you, but with someone else, yeah. there is a difficult to do trust transfer job that should be done on the call rather than leaving it to your account executive to do the hard work of, avoiding sitting getting in a trust hole themselves yes and i think there are a few things that can be done in that the one is and again my personal bugbear is never set up a meeting that will be a demo and i know many sales leaders have charged the sdr team and compensate them on setting up demo meetings yeah but what a setup for failure if you're an account executive and you're walking into a prospect who's expecting a demo, you have no idea which features to show, yeah. no idea what problems they're trying to solve or what success looks like or who they are. They don't trust you at all. They're probably half asleep and they're waiting for you to get to the end of it because they're you know, regretting the fact that they said yes, but too impolite to, to not show up. Yeah. And so I, I think it's the death of the sales relationship to sell a demo as the second meeting. Death by demo. Yeah, death by demo. And I would rather say, you know, what's common in the sales industry is that the next call will be with an account executive who gives you a demo. And you can count on me not to do that. And my partner, Eric, will not give you a demo on the next call, even though we're a SaaS provider. Here's why. At Science, we are committed to deeply understanding who you are, what problems you're trying to deal with right now, what success might look like for you, what you've already tried and what you think might work, and most importantly, what you're looking for in a partner. And we'd like the next call to earn the right today to have that conversation with you. And if it goes well, and you feel like we might be a match, and frankly, if we feel like we might be a match for you or a fit for you, then and then only will we set up time to do a demo. How does that sound? I love that. And you might get fewer meetings, but I would rather... Mm. Do death by demo and have lots of meetings, none of which turn into any interest. I don't know if you're going to get fewer meetings because what what I my ears heard were was still when you dipped into role play, honoring my time as a prospect, which I think is a really important variable. Um, and it's a two way street, right? Like everyone's smart enough to recognize a sales situation, and if there is exploration and and wanting to explore fit, which would be the reason for saying yes to a demo in the first or yes to a meeting in the first place. Um, 
you're elevating it. You're not making it kind of like one size fits all, which I think is, is probably better. I think so. You know, it, it's hard to tell which of the, these methods leads to improvement because I think all of them together make a difference. Yeah. But I agree with your point. And, you know, the, I said the other thing you can do is transfer trust carefully. And how I usually hear it done is, you know, thanks for this meeting. We've got it on the calendar. Next week, week, week you'll be meeting with Eric. He's a good guy. You're in safe hands. And that's done nothing to establish you as a trustworthy person, except say, you're probably a salesperson, so watch out, prospect. Yeah. Versus using what I call an endorsement, which is just sharing three things about someone. One that demonstrates they're credible. One that tells you about the amazing impact they've had and continue to have. And one that quickly humanizes them. Yeah. So I might say, you know, Next week, you'll be in the safe hands of Eric. He's not only the chief marketing officer and has a fantastic career in sales and marketing in this industry, credibility part. Yeah. But he's helped organizations like yours completely turn around their sales machine. So impact. And what you need to know about Eric is he is a fantastic baseball player. So if you share a love for baseball, bring it up with him. You'll have a great chat. Boom. Yeah. And I like to end with that because the lasting impression is, ah, Eric's, you know, an, a human, not yeah. a sale. And that, you know, the, the number one place to look of, if you can accomplish that as part of the appointment setting process, hold rates should naturally go up for that next meeting because especially when we feel like we've humanized somebody else. It doesn't feel as bad if you, you know, kind of shirk or shock or like otherwise bail on a meeting of someone that you don't view as a human. It's just part of the process. You know, it's just a demo versus someone like that just got humanized. And it would be like, Oh, I'm, I'm letting them down missing that's, that's costing true. them time. I think we are more inclined to turn down a meeting with someone. We can't remember who they are, what it's about. So anything we can do to increase that memory and excitement increases show up rates. But I do think there's a bunch of other things you can do once you've done all the hard work to actually win a meeting to make sure that the person shows up. One of them is obvious, which is a follow-up email Yes. I, in fact, I recommend two. One is to say, thank you so much for allowing me to be an introduction. We chatted briefly about this and I have set up a meeting for you to meet Eric next week. A re reminder, here's the three things about Eric you should know. And this mm -hmm. is what Eric will spend his time doing with you. I love that agenda setting, by the way. So I smart. So too, including a time. So it's clear like what will happen, just like we did in our call. And the other thing I would do is, is the day before, send a reminder email to say, we so, or frankly, it should come from now, Eric, to say, yeah, so looking forward to Andrew did a great job in his first conversation and tells me that you're X, Y, and Z, you know, this person with that credibility and that humanizing quirk, if I found it so on the call. And I can't wait to spend time with you. And as Andrew said, my commitment is, and to repeat it, because I think it's one thing for me to promise on your behalf. It's another to come from the AE's mouth before that meeting happens. I couldn't agree more. And a great way to kind of like even go deeper on that human level of expressing excitement, anticipation around meeting with you. Exactly. Exactly. And if you wanted to, without being creepy, demonstrating that you've done your homework, you could say, I had a chance to look at your LinkedIn profile. I've sent you a connection, which should be an a nice humanizing connection message. And I'm so excited to talk to you for these reasons and point to something in their profile. Totally agree. Versus the sort of proverbial and fake, ah, Eric, I see a picture of kids in the background. You have kids? Tell me about them. <laughs> or I see you've got a purple scarf there. Are you a Wildcats fan? <laughs> so you're not where you live, but taking a flyer anyway. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I love this. That these are such great suggestions and my suspicion is is that this the the wisdom that you've shared, the insights that you've shared with us today um are but barely scratching the surface 
of what working with you at Habits at Work might entail? I think so. You know, our philosophy is that sales training, even when it's done well, and even when people love the experience, is quickly forgotten and seldom implemented. Yeah. And being a smart salesperson is not enough. It's both knowledge, well, all of knowledge, skill, and the discipline to use the right skill at the right time over time, which is habits. So unless you're in the habit of doing these things, don't expect a result. Right. And the truth is, habits are hard to create and hard to sustain. And so you're right. Our promise to people is we'll help you develop the habits that make you a magnetic, trusted human being. And as a result, a highly effective seller. I love that. And I, th I think anyone who's listened to this episode would probably agree that that's exactly <laughs> what a lot of companies need. Where can they go and, and learn more? Get thank you for asking. Uh, experience with you. Continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you for asking. I, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So I would love any of your listeners or watchers to connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me with my name, Andrew Sykes and Habits at Work. Please check us out on Habits at Work, H-A-B-I-T-S-A-T-W-O-R-K.com or my personal speaking site, Andrew Sykes, last name spelled S-Y-K-E-S.com. Any of those channels, uh, I love to have conversations with people. As you can tell, I kind of like talking. I love listening and sales is very near and dear to my heart. So thank you for asking. I'd love that connection. You bet. This was a real blessing for us. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for asking such insightful questions and labeling a lot of what we were talking about. It's a pleasure speaking to you and listening to you. You bet. My pleasure, Andrew. <laughs>